you know, for, for me, I, I absolutely adored working at Commodore. It was, it was my DNA. I couldn't wait to get into work every day. My team was fantastic, and we loved every second of every day. It was just amazing. Uh, it, was, it was terrific. Um, when, when you're seeing people coming around like scavengers bidding for things, well, I'll give you five quid for that table and, and two quid for this and all of that. It was, um, it was horrible, really. Um, but, but more than that, it's like, because it was the end of an era. And, and for me personally, I mean, it has been such a huge part of my DNA for 12 and a half years. It's, it's really, I'm, I'm guessing, although, although thankfully I've never had uh, the feeling, but I'm guessing it must have been like losing a child. They were probably the largest, uh, or second largest uh, PC manufacturer in Europe. And they bought out the silica stores in the UK. Uh, I think they bought a hundred and odd stores. And Rumbelows, yeah. Well, they produced this thing called the Walker. Yeah, it looked like uh, a cross between a vacuum cleaner, Darth Vader's helmet, and K9 Doctor Who's metal, metal dog. We went to see Manfred Schmidt, who was the uh, founder and managing director of ESCOM, and we suggested that it might be a worthwhile thing for him to consider buying Commodore UK as a going concern. And I think this is probably indicative of them as a company. He, he tried to blackmail Colin and I, and he said you know, that I will buy Commodore UK, but only if you and Colin work for me. And frankly, we didn't want to work for him. And then he said, well, in that case, then he said, you'll have to go back and tell all your employees that they're out of, they're out of a job because you turned me down. There is a massive um, need for in our community is to find out what has happened since uh, ESCOM bought the, uh, the assets from Commodore in the auction in New York, which I was actually at. Um, what happened, how ESCOM basically screwed things up. I would say people had real genuine plans to rebuild the Amiga uh, platform and uh, some, were, some were definitely uh, hoaxes, but the vast majority of people spent a lot of time, money and effort trying to, to uh, recreate the Amiga dream. And, and, and I always, when I say Amiga dream, it always sounds a bit strange, but, but it, it really was, if you're an Amiga today, dating back to the 80s and 90s, I mean, it was a, it was a fantastic time for computing. In my opinion, it's the, it's the most significant technology I've seen since Commodore. The story that, that Dave and I are going to tell, will tell about the post-Commodore, yeah, all right, there's, some, there's lots of lows, but there are many highs, but actually how it actually survived and continues to, to today in all its various, and I say wonderful forms, and let's celebrate the wonderful forms. It was a mess. It was definitely um, uh, court cases and what have you. Uh, but through all of that, we've come up with some incredible developments. So uh, I've called a book From Vultures to Vampires, 25 Years of Copyright Chaos and Technological Triumph.